We have a football comedy mashup tonight. I'm joined by Aldo, Harto, Hursto, and Lalo. That's John Aldridge, John Hart, and Lee Hurst, and Eric Lawler to the rest of us. They're all here on the Craig Doyle Show. <laughs> Good evening, all. Good evening, audience. How are you? Yeah. Well, audience, say hello to my friends, please. John, Lee, and Eric. Hey, hey lads, you all have one thing in common. One major thing in common. We're yeah. all handsome. You're all handsome. Yeah. And two things in common. <laughs> Your first big, big, huge break was an accident. Each one of you. Yeah? You accidentally warmed up for someone in, in the studio and you, you ended up on, on the show. Mm -hmm. Same for you. And you uh, played for Liverpool because you looked like Ian Rush. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Oh. John, though, the thing is, right, when Ian Rush decided to go to Juve, that's when yeah. they were looking for a man to go front and, and you were brought in. You do look very like him. Right, that's not lost on you. Can we, have a, we have a little photograph of the two of you together, OK? Because... <laughs> <laughs> Quite shocking, yeah. yes. Yeah, people even know. Funny enough, I was coming through the airport there today and uh, a woman again said, yeah, Rush. Have you seen Rushy now? He's, got, he's, got, he's completely grey-haired now, Rushy, you know what I mean? Give us a break, right. you know? What? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, no, you're right. He, Rushy was going to Juventus, and um, I was doing OK for Oxford at the time, along with Ray Alton and uh, um, David Langan. And, uh, you know, and uh, he, he thought I'd, I'd do a job. Kenny Dalglish came in for me, and, uh, you know, it was a dream, cos I'd watched Liverpool from the age of six, gone to the games, and... I, I had to pinch myself, I couldn't believe it. Um, let's talk about uh, present-day Liverpool, first of all, OK? And uh, far cry from the glory days when you were there at the moment. Mm. It's interesting, actually, Rodgers was saying in the last couple of weeks that if they finish, you know, eighth or above, that'll be a really good season. Mm. Gosh, yeah, ten years ago, the thought of that sentence would shock you, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yes, yeah, well, less than ten years, I have to say. In the last two or three years, it's shock us. Because uh, it's something Liverpool Football Club have not been used to over the years. You know, been highly successful. Unfortunately, we're in a massive... Transition period. Uh, the, the manager's coming. He's got different thoughts, different methods, um, and he needs different individuals to fit that. And at the moment, he hasn't got them. Transfer deadline day was was a massive uh, negative where Liverpool was concerned because Andy Carroll went out thinking that a player was going to come in and Dempsey, and it just fell flat at the last minute, leaving us with just one striker plus Young Barini was coming in, and, and that's why we struggled. And I was solely dependent on Luis Suarez, who's having a great season. But come January, we've got to get through to January, and Liverpool will be buying a couple of players uh, minimum. How many? I'd like to see three, in all honesty. Whether the, the owners will, will give the manager that amount of money, I, I, I don't know. I'd like to think so. But, but certainly, if you can get two quality players who can get your goals from, from the areas where we need them, then that'll suffice till the end of the season and there's still a bit more work to be done. Is this a right point to say that I actually know nothing about football? <laughs> <laughs> I just want people to know that, because although I was on that show, I really know nothing about football. I'm, tr I'm trying to trade in it. I know little bits, but not a lot. <laughs> how did you get away with working on... Uh, they think it's all over when you have no idea about football. I mean, how did that happen? <laughs> well, I'm sure everybody here will agree that when you go for a job interview, you lie. Yeah. You? So <laughs> you blag your way in. That's basically... I don't know. I mean, I was, Harry disliked me because I was doing the funnies, really. And I kind of had some sporting trivia knowledge. And I probably knew a, a bit more about football then than I do now. Um, you know, no dis I'm, I'm not disrespecting you because you're, you're not playing any longer, but to me, it does seem to just, like we were just saying, it's just checkbook, well, not checkbook journalism, checkbook football. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know why they haven't given them names anymore. They should just have barcodes on as they run around the pit. <laughs> you know, and it just, the price comes up. It's like, you know, four, 14 million passes to 13 million. 30 million 20 million, it's like, oh! Like that. You know, and always another Russian comes in. And I just, I, you know, so I kind of lost interest in it a little bit on, on that, Scott. But back in the day on the, on the show, I just had bits of trivia knowledge that I knew. Plus, on the show, I would ask the guests questions. Uh, I genuinely would ask them, what's this? I, I think I asked What's this the... ball thing about? <laughs> no, no, there was, a, there was another guy, a boxer once. I, I think I actually asked him, what's it like when you get hit? Like, really stupid question. <laughs> to which he replied, honestly, it hurts. Which was <laughs> kind of what I expected. But, uh, but yeah, I kind of got away with it. You talk about barcodes, actually, watching uh, Ireland against Greece last night. It was basically, you know, whatever, 85 billion 
<laughs> versus 65 billion yes. in debt. Well, Not a was... great game. Ireland uh, lost 1-0. Uh, I mean, how do you feel about our, our situation, well, Lee, from afar? Well, the financial afar? situation. Yes. Well, I, the game was delayed because when they flipped the coin to start the game, it disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> it was... It's all tails. Where's it gone? Where's it gone? Where's it gone? <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was... I think it was titled the IMFA Cup Final. <laughs> <laughs> But it was interesting because Platini was there as his role as president of, of UEFA, I think it is, is it? And yes. he, he was there in the Aviva last night to present the Irish fans with an award yeah. for being the best fans in the world. And like all traditional award ceremonies, it was like, well, unfortunately, the Irish fans couldn't be here tonight to accept the award. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, they didn't. They didn't. Uh, they didn't sell out. I don't think they expected to sell out. But do you worry about about support? You know, waning a little bit. Um, I worry about us never getting back to to where we were in our lands because you know, coming to the end of a, of a conveyor belt where we had players. You know, with all due respect to the squad, top draw players from top draw teams, and the diluted, the disappeared somewhere. Um, I just hope we can get them players back. You know, that's. The only way to do that is through grassroots football in many ways. We may have to wait, like Liverpool, we may have to wait as well on the international scene because I think we're going to struggle for, for, for a bit of time now, I really do. It's interesting, I think, from your era, you know, in those glory days, it's kind of, it's kind of made life very hard for the current crop of players because yeah. they were such great days. Should we have a little reminder of those days? Yeah, yeah you want a bit of that? Have a peek at this. Well, what's going on here? The John Aldridge wants to go on, and the officials won't let him on. It's the old story, give a man a hat. They feel they have their part to play. Sheridan and McAteer. Back for Aldridge! Yes! That's it! The fresh legs of Jason McAteer, the pinpoint accurate cross. That's the business for John Aldridge. Oh, oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> 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 well, well, well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I heard twat. I heard, <laughs> I heard dickhead. I heard a couple of things I can't repeat. I know. It's wow. a great clip, that. It, it, it's one that I've seen now, I can laugh at when I was first seen it. The, <laughs> the more than nothing to get. I, I didn't know I was getting, obviously, the, the cameraman must have got pissed off with the game and he's panned on me. And he, oh, dear me. Oh, 50 seconds. Of, I didn't even know I had them words in my vocabulary, to be quite honest. <laughs> I can't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he wouldn't let me on. The ball didn't go out of play for some three or four minutes. Like, we're 2 0 down. You know, Mexicans in this. It's ridiculous heat and humidity, and we were ten men on the pitch because of the clown there, and then the fellow with the app from I think uh, uh, Egypt, I think he was from. Jack nearly planted him as well, didn't he? <laughs> um, and then when I went on, I was like, I just like a raven lunatic. I just lost it completely. Yeah. yeah, but you see, then scoring, you see, there you go, justifies it all. Yeah, it? yeah, he did me a favour. He wound me up a little bit, I think, and uh, it was nice. I thought it was a consolation at the time. Uh, you know, we, we lost two one. And then Tony Cascarino ran on the pitch and said, that, that's like a point all though. I said, what are you on about? What planet are you on? He said, well, we only need to draw the last game now against Norway rather than having to win it. So it was a huge, huge goal for him. You know, one that I'll, I'll always look back and cherish. You roomed with Ray Houghton. Yeah. What, what, what was that like? Right? All right, yeah, we were good friends from when, when I um, went to Oxford. Uh, he followed me shortly after. And, uh, you mean the, the you team, Oxford? Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. <laughs> you just dropped that in. Yeah. Yeah. It, it wasn't university, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Take it from me, it wasn't that place. I could see you wearing those hats on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Ray followed on and uh, we, got, we got very friendly. Uh, our wives got very friendly. And then, you know, obviously, the story with, with Ireland, which a lot of people know about, but I, Jack Charlton actually came to see me play against Aston Villa in the semi final, the, 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 the Mill Cup the at Mill the time. Cup, yeah. And the first leg, and I met Jack after the game in the players' lounge, and he came up to me and said, John, I'm the new Republic of Ireland manager. I said, I know Mr Charlton. And he said, we'd like you to come and play for us. So I said, I'd be honoured. He said, I said, brilliant. You play against uh, Wales in six weeks' time at uh, Lansdowne Road and make your debut. I said, yeah, see the lad over there as well, Mr Charlton, Ray Houghton. He said, yeah. He said, he played well tonight, and he said... Is that from, from Donny Goal, you know? He said, is he? Bring him with you, he can have a game as well. <laughs> <laughs> so he actually did get to the price of one of the two. 
<laughs> See ya. Um, but hey, look, Lee, you might you might be a you might be a football expert. But my word, uh, <laughs> oh, you're a very sorry, funny no man expert, at all. expert at all. <laughs> you might know much about football, but I do know something you do know a lot about. Have a look at this. Uh, uh, I don't know the voice, but same. Jimmy Hill. Jimmy Hill. Ow! Turn this way. Gaza. Gaza. Who's on last week? Chris Agabusi. I know what we were chatting about backstage about injuries and whatever. When I did that and I went over, there was like a, a, a raised bit at the back, and as I went over, I cut my shoulder open on this, this lip at the back. And I did, you know, you, your mind re reacts a lot faster than any, any other part of you. And as I've gone back, my shoulder hit it, and it, I felt it, and I thought it's going to be my head next, but unfortunately I kept my head up like that. I got to the dressing room, took it out, and there was a massive stripe on my shoulder Whoa. and blood pouring. <laughs> That's because you did the Monica Just Sellers impression. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't nothing to do with Jimmy, Jimmy Green. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it was, uh, I, I, I see, I've, I've bled for my humour. Hang, <laughs> hang on, no, you've had no. a rough time with things over the last 10 years. I mean, you know... <laughs> the, that, last, the last 50 years. The last, but, yeah. I mean, that, that clip we saw there is, is, you know, a few years ago, that, the, la the last 10 years, we, we'll talk about the hard problems, first yeah. of all. And people might wonder why, why, why we have seen them on TV enough. You know, you know, your your, your health has had a lot to do with that, hasn't it? Yeah, I've, I've had um, I've rattled through it. I've got ankylosing spondylitis, which is a, a, a incurable condition of the spine. I've had that since I was 23. Uh, that's the condition, not the spine. I've had that all my life. <laughs> and um, I've had I've had asthma since I was a child. Uh, I had acid reflux, which is when stuff comes up into your throat. That's sorted itself out now. Um, and I've got arrhythmia in my heart. I'm stuck on A in the medical textbook. You may have wow. uh, uh, Pinch alopecia. We'll say that as well, right? But, um, <laughs> but that's the most recent one was the arrhythmia. And that was four years ago it started. You know, with all that in mind, it's amazing that you're out touring again. I'm delighted you're out touring again. Yeah, and the reviews great. for the shows have been absolutely brilliant. I've been reading all of them. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, tell, tell everyone what it's all about. Oh, it's, uh, it was called, it was going to be called, this tour was going to be called The End of the World Show, because as we all know, it's supposed to end this year. Uh, but then I Googled that and found out it had already been taken. So I changed it after a few titles. I ran a few titles by my friends and I called it um, Too Scared to Leave the House. And originally it was going to be about things that were going to destroy us, but it kind of changed into just people's like fears, anybody's fears, what they may be. And um, so when I do the tour in the, leading up to the interval, I encourage the audience to write down during the interval what their fears are. And then when I come out in the second half, we, we chat through those. John, big fear? Um, Man United winning the Premiership for the 20th. <laughs> 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 I'm giving you that one. I'm giving you that one, <laughs> okay, but that's mate, it. Nice. Um, hey, look, uh, football has obviously been long associated with providing an escape for, for the less fortunate. Uh, lots of tales of kids playing barefoot in the slums of Brazil to working class kids, avoiding a life of crime. Um, I'm sure you've got memories of hard times when you're starting out, John, I'm sure. Uh, living in terrible digs, not having any money, having to put up with Ray Houghton. Um, <laughs> well, as a Monty Python character might say, bloody luxury. Take a look at this. Trapatoni's boys going through a bit of a rough patch, but we're here to meet an Irish football team that's actually been to a World Cup in the last 10 years. So you were in Mexico, what was that like? I was in Mexico, I was in Mexico. I should have brought a blade to come over as well. Sean, tell us how it all got started, the Ireland's homeless football team. Well, this uh, was an initiative by the Big Issue magazine. Homelessness manifests itself on the street and every kid plays football. And if you could bring the two together, it'd be a nice way of raising the issue of homelessness. I got involved through uh, the street leagues down in Port Leash. We set up about four or five years ago. It's for all walks of life, like, you know. It's for... So give people a, a, a chance in life. Yeah, but in with football, they're accepted. Because, because you're good at it. They're gang else, you know. We all have talent, it's just, it's just out there, we just went down the wrong road. When people play sport, no matter what sport they're involved in, it develops their sense of self-worth. And you can only contribute to society if you feel good about yourself. The Homeless World Cup has, has kept me out of prison. It costs me £100,000 to keep me in, in prison a year. So, could you imagine where that money would go to, you know? What you could do with that money. 
to keep you out of prison. To keep me out of prison, like yeah. you know, and, and give me and give me a chance. I was an alcoholic, and I got got through it through the football. I love coming up, and I love I love the banter. This is the best feeling, like to go away and represent your country is great, like you know what I mean. Mick, you've seen you're obviously coaching the team, and you've seen probably better than anybody how football can change lives. It's it's fantastic to see the spirit that that, that, that these guys have. They're just a, just a joy to be around, you know. And I I am lucky to actually be able to call them friends of mine. As Garrett mentioned, it costs 100 grand to keep him in jail for a year. And the home leagues are about keeping fellas like him out. All these lads want is a chance. So the question is, can football give him that? <laughs> <laughs> Skyed it! <laughs> And I'm delighted to say the lads from the Irish Homeless team are here tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Give a big round of applause. Gareth, that was your moment just to bury it in the top corner there, right at the end. I did twice and then he didn't catch it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. That's interesting, though, what you say there. Money could be better spent keeping people out rather than keeping them in. Yeah, it could, yeah. You know, as I said, it costs over £100,000 a year to keep me in prison. So. If if you spend that on, on giving people a chance and, and the likes of the street leagues, how many people that would be able to turn their life around by that, like, you know? And would you solely put it down to football changing? Well, it's league? kept me... I, I'm, I'm out of prison the last 12 months and it's true football that I, I, I've stayed out of prison, you know? How? Why? It's given me... A, the, the, the homeless, the World Cup has given me a goal to work on, you know, to, and it's, you know, it's got me back in contact with my son through the football as well, like, you know, because he loves football as well, like, you know. Good on you. Good on you. That's yeah. great. That's pretty good. Good on you. Good on you. Good on you. Um, actually, Tucker, you, you're the captain. Of, you said something interesting there, was that, you know, when you're playing football, people only see you as a footballer. All the other crap that you may have built up, all the baggage over the years, that disappears. How important is that, to, to, just to, to have that level playing field for you? It's very important, because, like, when you're growing up, and... As Gareth said, you're in trouble and whatever. Like, you're not accepted, but through football, you are accepted. And like, you express yourself. Do you know what I mean? You feel free, especially you got good at football. You know, when you, you, as like with John Aldridge earlier, like, you can see the passion, the passion is there. Do you know what I mean? And people, people see that and they see that in you, you know, when you are playing football and you can express it that way. Whereas, you know, you're not accepted anywhere else, but on a pitch, you are accepted because you can play, you know? That's You're accepted here, my friend. I think it's, uh, we're absolutely delighted to have the captain of an Irish football team here. I'm absolutely delighted to have you. Yeah. Right. Sean, this is uh, right. It's about football, but it's about far more than football, isn't it? What changes do you see in these guys <coughs> from when they turn up for the first time to yeah, what well, we see here now? For the not only when lads turn up for the first time, they're kind of quiet and they don't really mix that well. But over a period of time, you'll see them coming out themselves. You'll see them have a sense of self worth and. Um, self-esteem and you'll see them develop their communication skills like we got guys <laughs> and you wouldn't even talk at all over a two-week period and you couldn't shut them up then you know <laughs> but it's all about building confidence is there anything we can do for you here tonight well the camera's all yours anything, well, anything you want to say could do, maybe you could uh, influence the government to maybe <laughs> get us some funding our way we also have a website where people can donate uh, com. Um, www.irishstreetleague.com where people can donate. People can donate. Well, that's great, and I hope people go on that. Lads, it's great to have you here, and thanks for coming on, and just good luck with the future. Give them a big round of applause. Good luck. Thank you. And the lighter side of things, lads, does ever get a bit of stick, you know, like playing for Ireland in the Homeless World Cup? Does anyone ever say, you know, hey, I'll watch our house, you turn around, what's that supposed to be? Do you hear what he said? No. We always play away. <laughs> good, on you, good, on you, good on you. Good to have you here, lads. Um, that's it for part one. After the break, we'll be joined by a man who's often been described as a wizard, but that's based purely on the fact he's Welsh. John Hartson will be here. Don't go away. I'm here with John Aldridge, Lee Hurst and Eric Lawler. Now, my next guest has fought battles both on and off the pitch, but he always comes out on top. This is him in action. Leonard. 
Larson and Hartson combining well. Here's Hartson opening for a shot. Hartson scored! It's over! Celtic are through for sure! What a strike by John Hartson! Would you please give a very warm Irish welcome to John Hartson! Where's the rest of you? My God, you're looking good. Do you think you're so? Looking, yeah, you're looking oh. in good shape. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, Thank fantastic. You. Great to have you here. Thank uh, you. Nice to be here. Your story is like, they should make a movie about, you know, the last few years because it's been, it's been hard for you, really hard for you. But let's, let's start with the most recent and happiest bit, OK? OK. Celtic beating Barca the other night. Oh, I know. It was yeah. special. I was very lucky to be a part of the, uh, the 2004 team that beats uh, Barcelona at Celtic Park. Alan Thompson with the goal, but... Uh, the other night, anybody who saw the game with the atmosphere there, and it was just amazing. There's something about the East End of Glasgow, them nights at Celtic Park with the crowd. They're, they're like a 12th man. They really, really are. And some of the teams that Celtic have beaten over the years have no right, really, to beat these teams. You know, the AC Milans and the Manchester Uniteds and the Juventus is... And obviously now they can add Barcelona to that list as well. Um, you didn't go all Rod Stewart on us, did you, when, you, with, when the, the final whistle went? No, no, <laughs> uh, but that was great pictures, you know, to see Rod. It just, just goes to show a man of his calibre, all the records, and, you know, he, he's a legend in his own right, Rod Stewart. Uh, wonderful artist, and uh, to be crying, it just goes to show what Celtic means to him. You know? Have you seen this, guys? Yeah. Oh, this is absolutely wonderful. Have you seen this? This is yeah. Rod Stewart's reaction to the final whistle the other night. Have a peek at this. It's brilliant. <laughs> oh, I love that. Great. <laughs> It is lovely to see emotion from such a, an iconic figure as Rod Stewart, but nobody's thought that maybe he had Barcelona in an accumulator. <laughs> <laughs> that was a bit and slip you could see. Like, oh, <laughs> Describe to me what it's like playing for Celtic. When I went to Celtic at 26, you know, Martin O'Neill was the manager. He paid, big, paid £6 million for me, and uh, it really is a, a special club. You know, with a 125-year history now this year, everybody's celebrating, and uh, genuinely, I played for lots of clubs, but Celtic is just a little bit special, you know. What does it feel like to be valued at... Somebody says you're worth £7 million, £7.5 million. Pounds. How does that feel? Because like, nobody else really... In, Walk of Life has a price on them, yeah. they? unless you're a criminal, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but how does it feel? Well, it was 7.5 million back in 1998. So, so we're five. talking 13 years ago. So, you know, Andy Carroll couldn't lace my boots. <laughs> you know, and he's just gone for 35 million. Yeah. So, you know, what is that today, really? You yeah. know? Um, but it does add a bit of pressure when you're record signing. And I broke three records. I was record at Arsenal alongside Ian Wright, who they bought from Crystal Palace. I was record signing at West Ham for 3.2, and then I was record signing at Wimbledon. So you'd be a record signing at a club, the pressure's straight on. Some footballers can just glide through a career and not have any pressures off the field and with the newspapers and the press, but I always played under pressure, mm. simply because of the price tag. It's the, it's the pressure from the press then. If you, if you, if you don't score goals, they jump on it straight away. Yeah, because you're record when, signing. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's when it can come difficult and play in people's minds and yeah. becomes a monkey on your back in many, many ways. Mm -hmm. um, you played with a great Gary Speed, yes. sadly, no longer with us. A great friend of yours as well, and I'm sure you're still just trying to cope with that. You know, it's, yeah, it's, it's only a year this month, is it? It is. It's the 27th of November <laughs> now coming up. It's the anniversary of... Uh, of Gary's death, which um, Gary was such an, an iconic figure in Wales, you know, like Rush, Hughes, Southall, the great, great players we've had over the years. And he was doing great things with the national side as well, you know, he'd, uh, he'd won the four out of his last five games, he got the players believing in, in his philosophy and the system that he was playing, they all looked up to Gary and, uh, you know, I think the big question is, everybody asks himself is why, really, Gary would have had his own reasons. Only he will ever know, I suppose, why he decided to take his life. But uh, tragic, tragic um, event, you know, and um, such a young, gifted man, 43 years of age, had a beautiful family, um, film star looks, um, you know, wonderful career, a great, great fella. And uh, I, he was somebody that I looked up to. He was my captain for 10 years, you know, with the Welsh team. and. Uh, I knew his dad, Roger, his mother, Carol, his wife, Louise, Eddie and Tommy, his sons, and uh, it's just so, so tragic. And even today, 
I'm still sort of coming to terms with the fact that he, he's no longer with us. Um, let's talk about yourself and, and what happened after your, your playing career ended, because I suppose, especially the way you played football, John, because you know, you're a tough man, you know, mm. and I suppose you probably had an air of invincibility about you. And then you get this shocking news that you've got severe cancer mm -hmm. and you know you're pretty riddled with it talk, talk to me about when you found out and how you dealt with it well uh, i remember going uh, i remember getting severe headaches first of all i had lumps on my testicles um but i was unaware that lumps on your testicles is a big big telltale sign of testicular cancer uh, i was doing everything i was i was fathering kids i was scoring goals i was getting through training i was training every day i was moving from club to club so i never really took that much notice of the lumps. I knew they were there. Uh, just little small lumps inside my scrotum on, on my testicles. Um, and over the years, obviously, that was testicular cancer that I had. I never quite knew it because I never went to get them checked, which I should have done. That was my mistake. And that's my advice now. Any young kids, any men feel any lumps on their testicles, it's imperative you go right away because you can avoid all, everything that I went through, you know, all, all the chemotherapy, all the time in hospital. And then when I went to, get, to finally get a, a diagnosis, I got told, um, you have testicular cancer. You know, they, they did like an ultrascan sound on a big screen that came up. And I think when you get told you've got cancer, your initial thoughts are, is that you're gonna die? That's what you think. It's the most awful thing to have been told. Um, and I cried in the car park for two hours on my own, just coming to terms with what I had just been told. You know, my wife, I had three children, Sarah, my wife, who's, who's in the green room with me tonight, she was heavily pregnant with Stephanie, who's now two and a half. How you bad know. was the cancer at that stage? Where was it? It was testicular cancer that had spread to my lungs and onto my brain. So I had to have two emergency brain operations where they inserted a shunt in my head, I had a blockage. Um, and I had two operations on my lungs. I had a tracheotomy there. I had my testicle removed. Um, and it was just a terrible, terrible experience, but I've been very blessed. Uh, I've, I've come out of it the other end. Uh, I see life now as totally different. I enjoy time now with my children, and uh, you can have 10 million pounds in the bank, you know, if you're strapped to a chair. If you can't enjoy walking along the beach and, and breathing in that, sucking in that fresh air, coming off the sea and jumping around with your children, what good is all that in the bank, you know? And, and you know, I'm happy now, and um, I think happiness comes from within. I think you have to find happiness with, with your children and your relationships you have with your wife and, and things like that. So I'm, I'm totally, totally in control. I know where I want to go. I know who was around my bed when I was battling for my life. You know, it was my mother and father, my wife, my children, not the schmucks, not the parasites. 20 years ago that John would have seen them, people that are nagging me for tickets and pestering me for this and that. Where were they? They were nowhere. I'll tell you where they are. The same people will be there this Saturday, pestering Gareth Bale and Alan Ramsey for tickets. They were nowhere. I know where I want to go. I know what I want to take with me. and I know what's important to me now in my world, you know. Um, and I'm, I'm, I feel I'm a much better more rounded person for it. Because John will tell you as well, when you're a footballer, you live in this incredible world where you're in a bubble. You're not appreciative of... John Toshak said to me once, he says, John, when you finish playing football, your life will begin. And no one's ever said a truer word to me. When you're a footballer, everything is there for you. Your cars, your houses, your money, you know, everything is there. When you finish, um, you know, you have to start again. You, you, re you start living in the real world. And, and that's where I am now, but I'm, I'm very, very uh, happy. Health-wise, uh, how are you? Health-wise, I'm great. Um, I go back, it's three and a half years now since I left hospital, July 2009. Um, I look after myself, I get in the gym, um, I do a lot of boxing, I don't fight, but I hit the bag and the pads. Um, <laughs> I take part in a lot of the events that I put on in my foundation. I've walked up Ben Nevis twice in the last three years. I've done some 10Ks and, and this, that and the other. And I just go back for a checkup once a year, and everything is staying away for now. But it's cancer. You know, my, my cancer could come back tomorrow. It could come back in 20 years. You know, the, the gentleman outside riding on his bicycle tonight, he can get it tomorrow. There is no parity or rhyme and reason to who gets cancer. Is there fear there? No, no, no fear at all. Uh, I feel like Superman today <laughs> because I shouldn't be here. You know, I, I'm blessed. 
I'm very, very fortunate to, to still be here, um, you know, and you'd have to be very, very naive uh, not to think that way, you know, but um, no, no fear. I don't, I don't hold any fear. I was never scared going through my life and challenges and when I went to play for Arsenal at 19 and West Ham and everything else, but, but cancer scared the life out of me. Just before you got cancer, you were going through huge stress because you had a gambling problem. Just to add, add to the series of things you're yeah. having to deal with, but uh, your gambling problem was quite bad, wasn't it? My gambling problem's always been there, always been there. I'm a compulsive gambler. I always have been and I always will be. I've been gambling since I was 10 years of age. Started with the fruit machines. And then when you started earning a bit more money, you know, uh, you get a bit more famous. You don't want to go into bookmakers. You set up accounts and, and it got out of control. And um, I, I gambled. I wasted a lot of money. Um, and it's an addiction, gambling. It really, and it's a major, major problem. There'll be gamblers in this audience tonight. You know, uh, it's a major problem in today's society. Not just in football. It's a terrible, terrible illness that ruins a lot of relationships, gambling. It's an illness. Mm. It's, it's like alcoholics, you know, it's, it's like drugs. You know, and once you come to terms with you've got an issue and you, you, you go looking for help, there is help out there. And the best thing I ever did was not my Welsh caps or playing for Celtic or playing for Arsenal. Or the best Christmas present I can ever give my wife and my children is Daddy's Clean. Good man. You, you know, Good man. Best. <laughs> you know, and... Um, and I'll always be clean. You know, if I ever gamble again, I'll die. That's the way I treat my addiction now. I'll die. I won't die physically, but I'll lose my wife, I'll lose my children, and I'll just as well be dead without them because they're my rock, they're my world. Um, you know, and, and as I said, you're not an alcoholic. You don't, if you're an alcoholic, you're an alcoholic for life. You don't just after five years decide to go to the pub for lunch. Mm. You know, and I'll be going to GA for the rest of my life. I go twice a week now and I've been 14 months clean. I don't even think of gambling these days. I've got no problems with gambling. I can walk past bookmakers. Not in, I've not bought a raffle ticket, you know, and, um, and that's the best thing I've ever done in my whole life, other than obviously coming through the cancer, was walk through them GA doors to join that fellowship 14 months ago. That is the biggest achievement I've ever done that's in my great. life. That's great. That's um, great. You talk about you knew you had lumps on your testicles for four years mm -hmm. and you didn't do anything about it. I think everyone at home, all the men in the audience, all the blokes at home, and I'm not doing this for for an hour reasons, I think everyone should check their testicles now. Absolutely. Including us. Yeah. You're for that boys? You're for that audience? You can do it, you can do it sitting down. <laughs> Seriously, I'm serious. I think we should can talk us say, through. Let's can do it. Just say there's some nervous women out don't there. Don't worry about it. You don't have testicles. <laughs> it's fine. No, seriously. Do this at home, right? Okay. You can turn your back if embarrassed. What are we looking yes. for? And listen at home. Seriously. Seriously, lads, you can do this sitting down. We can right. turn your back for pride reasons Talk if you want. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Talk us through it, John. Seriously, what are we looking for? Right, well, you put your hands down your... <laughs> you put your hands down your trousers first. Just, just a second, John. Some of the guys are turning around and facing women now. <laughs> <laughs> you you, you don't have to turn around. You can, you, can stay, you can stay facing us. OK, go on. So what are yes, we looking for? And you go, you put your hands on your scrotum. In my case, um, I've got to check the one ball, because I've only got the one. <laughs> but most of you will have two. So just feel back, gently back around your testicles and just feel for little small lumps. Uh, them lumps might not be testicle. I hope to God they're not. They might be cysts, boils, but it's imperative if you do feel a lump on your testicles, it's very, very important you go and check because that's a big, big telltale sign of testicular cancer. And in my case, I had lumps and I left it, and it spread. It spread to my lungs and onto my brain, which is what you don't want. So my message Good. is to check and go and, and get it looked at straight away. And I realise that's probably a really strange thing to do on national television, but it could be the most important thing you do in your that's life, right. OK? So, yeah. you know... Sorry to say, but Eric was checking mine. <laughs> <laughs> Eric Lee can check his own testicles. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizer. <laughs> um, great talking to you guys. John, fantastic talking to you. Uh, fascinating story. Uh, I want to thank all my guests tonight, ladies and gentlemen. John Hartson. John Aldridge. Lee Hurst. And Eric Lawler.
And if you want to see Eric Lawler close up for yourself, he's live at City Limits Club in Cork this Saturday night. If you want to join us here, very easy. You can email us at cds at rte.ie. Thanks for watching and good nights. Yeah.